Hello, good afternoon. Uh, nice to have you again. So um, what I did uh, before I, uh, I got online is I attached a file and the file is just to read because uh, there's just one question uh, on the uh, on the test per, uh, pertinent to it. And um, it just happened so that you were uh, the timing of the class. I want I always want to give everyone a good five days, uh, at least four, if not five days to do each assignment. So I didn't try to squeeze it in. But there is looking at the test. There is one question on it. OK, and um, thank you for your patience. Uh, I started a week sooner at another school. And I've um, I've done a couple grades of their classes, and so you guys are next. Okay, so thank you for your patience, as I will get on to your grades very soon. Okay, uh, but before I begin, uh, are there any questions or comments? All right. Okay. Well, feel free at any time. Okay. Uh, if you don't mind, um, uh, if you could use the signal, like putting your hand up and then uh, unmute yourself. And I, I'd love to hear from you at any time during the um, the Zoom. OK, so with this one, right, I admit right here. OK, I, it's it's very I try to qualify it to be as um, truthful as I can. But in doing this thesis, right, uh, I, I really did have to um, kind of cherry pick uh, the facts. Right. Because remember, you have a um, an historian's uh, an historian's uh, task is to select facts, and just as the historian selects facts, he or she chooses to conveniently omit others that go don't go along with his or her thesis or preconceived notions, etc. So, especially when it comes to causation in history, uh, there's a lot of subjectivity. Um, but on this one, right, there's there's some cherry picking for sure uh, with the facts. And the Whigs, right? The English Whigs, uh, they're the Liberal Party of the Whigs from, uh, my goodness, it's been a long time. They're a very old party. Um, but real simple thesis, right, is that they want history to go in a direction that is more amenable to uh, private and personal uh, autonomy, uh, you being your own boss, the arbiter of your own destiny, uh, you being as free as possible. And... Um, coupled with uh, participatory government. Uh, you have the right to, uh, in one way or another, uh, participate in the republic that you live in. So what they are hoping for, right, is that history is going to and has uh, evolved uh, in that direction toward greater personal freedom and more particip public participation uh, in government. So what they do is they look at their own nation, right? And they contend that their nation is at the forefront of that evolution, that England is as much of a liberty loving, uh, uh, tyrannical, uh, opposing uh, nation of people as, as you could find. OK. So what I try to do is I try to go through uh, the different phases uh, of English history and try to prove in one way or another, show how they were perhaps anomalously, right, out of the ordinary for their time, uh, fighting for freedom and uh, fighting for uh, popular government. And it's tough. Uh, some of the some of the eras, you don't find much uh, that aren't convenient to that thesis, but you can find some, okay? So um, what I start off with with supportive data is that the Celtic people and the Celtic people, uh, as well as the Angles and the Saxons, uh, where they get the term Anglo-Saxon, uh, they both were very quite uh, deliberately decentralized into uh, kin-based tribes, and they liked it that way. So then not only that, you have the, the, the heroic fight that the Celtic people put up against the Romans uh, when the Romans uh, took over England and named it Britannia. Um, and, you know, I just I, I think of Gaul, how long it took Caesar to take Gaul. That's present day France. You know, like it, this, they're not the only country. But again, here we go. Um, the Celtic people put up a, quite a fight against the Romans. You had Queen Boudicca and Canonicus, and they both uh, were willing to die uh, before being um, colonized by the Romans. So I try to really play that up, okay, in Whig history. And then, of course, uh, the Romans don't stay very long, because although Rome was a republic for a while, right, 
uh, the Republic had fallen apart by the time they really became uh, an international empire. Uh, yeah, they took they took Spain by like 250 uh, BC. So Spain was under the Republic for a while, um, but but England was later. And then not only that, when Rome began to fall uh, in the early 400s AD, uh, the Britannia was a low priority. And so they evacuated their forts. Uh, they told their men that they had given um, uh, veteran colonies to uh, to report back to Rome uh, to take on the Lombards and the, um, I think it was the Ostrogoths, Lombards and the Vandals. So at any rate, um, uh, they they evacuated uh, Britain. Uh, and uh, at that time, right, during that vacuum, uh, the Angles and the Saxons came. And yes, when the Angles and Saxons came, they had a few things to support the Whig thesis. Uh, for one, as I already mentioned, uh, they were quite decentralized uh, deliberately. Uh, they also had representative bodies. Uh, they were called uh, uh, Wittengemot, uh, or just Wittens, uh, W-I-T-T-A-N, if you want to look further into that. So they had their Wittens. They had their villages of 100 uh, with, a, with a, uh, a village council as well as a village court. And in those courts, right, peers were able to judge peers. And so they're, they're way ahead of their time as far as like a trial by jury, uh, by peers, et cetera. Uh, so the, the Angles and Saxons, uh, of course, they could be brutal. And they took a long time to become Christian. Um, but they didn't take much of Rome, uh, especially the, the empire part, right? And uh, so they didn't take the 12 tablets, the Lex Hortensia, the different Roman law. Uh, they kept things very decentralized and um, in Anglo-Saxon manner. And then you fast forward to the time around 900 and you have the, the Danes, right? The Vikings from Denmark and the Danes will take over, uh, but there is evidence that the Danes had a dual legal system. Uh, they had Dane law uh, for themselves and they let the English stay under English common law. They let them keep their village hundreds, uh, their courts, uh, their own legal entities. Uh, they also, um, began giving um, certain uh, uh, privileges to the towns. Uh, they had a, a, a Latin term uh, in the Middle Ages where they said, uh, uh, city air makes one free. And so the different cities, right, they developed uh, these exceptional, um, uh, these rights whereby they were immune to the certain uh certain whimsical decisions by a king or queen. But again, you know, to be fair, uh, the Spanish did too. They were called fueros. Uh, their towns, many of the towns had fueros, the same thing. But uh, so they, they, they show that, they demonstrate that. And then of course um, you had in 1066, uh, the Normans uh, from, from Norway, and they had first colonized France. And so they, they invaded from France, uh, uh, from Normandy, uh, on D-Day, uh, 1066. So kind of ironic, right? The, uh, June 6th, they, uh, in 1066, they invade from Fran uh, a French invader, uh, invades England, and then uh, D-Day in 1944, uh, England and the Allies invade France. But at any rate, um, that was uh, William II, known as William the Conqueror, and um, he was a bit, he was a bit ruthless, and, and um, I, I definitely wouldn't call him liberty-loving. Uh, matter of fact, when it came to land ownership, uh, his different noblemen, uh, they're usually considered dukes and counts, uh, were granted a lot of the Angles and Saxons uh, land, but particularly the nobility. It was the nobility that was fighting one another more so than the peasants uh, over land ownership because they left a lot of the, uh, the villages intact. But at any rate, um, so the Normans, they were not they were not equitable. They were not fair with land ownership. Uh, but but then again, you don't have, um, they were constantly fighting. Uh, uh, so for instance, the Scots, right, where the pikes were, uh, the Scots, as well as uh, Wales, uh, were, were seen as symbols of resistance. Uh, they never quite like fully, really conquered them. And um, Wales has its own very unique history. Uh, so at any rate, um, then you go forward to a few events. You have the Magna Carta uh, with King John, right? And 
and yes, the nobility had primarily their own um, exemptions and their own rights in mind. I don't think they were caring much about the peasants at that time, but it trickled down. Uh, it, it protected the peasants just as it protected them, uh, despite their uh, their motives. So with the Magna Carta, the Great Charter of 1215, uh, the king announced that he was not above the rule of law and he could not become a tyrant and, and do as he pleases. So the rule of law is big in English political history uh, because the, the law, right, is supposed to, especially if it's a bit liberal, um, if it's universal, uh, it doesn't play favorites. It doesn't change on a whim, uh, et cetera. It's a lot safer against tyranny uh, than the personality and charisma of one single ruler. So uh, the, you had a trial by jury uh, in, in uh, specifically, you had property confiscation, which he could not engage in. You had taxation. He now had to have consent, uh, et cetera. It was pretty big. And so you have the Magna Carta, and I have that in here. And then I skip forward to the English uh, Civil War. Uh, Charles I uh, claimed a divine right to rule as he pleased, and he ended up literally losing his head for it. And uh, they had a civil war. And by that time, right, the people in the cities had really garnered, and it happens a lot in human history, uh, when you have a demographic, a class that that develops economically, it doesn't take long for them to begin making demands politically uh, for their rights. And we call them generically, right, the bourgeoisie, the people of the city. And um, that's what happened here in England. And it happened elsewhere, too. But you could make the argument as far as the development of parliament uh, that, that they, um, with the exception of Portugal, uh, that England was pretty far ahead of everybody else. Uh, chronologically. So you had something kind of like the Privy Council uh, as far back as the Angles and Saxons and the Normans. And then you're going to have the evolution from that into um, to a full-blown uh, parliament. Uh, it first started with a council. And then by the time of the English Civil War, uh, they had a lower popularly elected branch, the House of Commons. So then you had the religious components to it as well that we'll get into today. Uh, but a lot of the bourgeoisie uh, went with the Protestant Reformation. And so um, they were, uh, and they didn't want to be ostentatious. Uh, they were trying to, uh, it was supposed to be an act of class solidarity as well as uh, humility. And a lot of them shaved their heads. And so they, they were called the roundheads uh, against the cavaliers who were loyal to King Charles. So at any rate, um, you know, and of course those who were, uh, who were, um, uh, loyal to King Charles, many of them were noblemen uh, because he did kind of a quid pro quo system with them, helping them out, giving them privileges, giving them land and titles uh, for their loyalty. But uh, King Charles will lose the Civil War. The Roundheads win. Uh, they try him for treason and violation of English common law and tyranny, and they beheaded him. And so then I skip forward to the Glorious Revolution of 1688, and that was James II. He too was trying to divide, uh, trying to declare divine right to rule, and uh, he was literally kind of chased out of the country, and they would not let him come back and inhabit the throne. They offered it to William of Orange from the Netherlands and uh, Mary, and William and Mary, however, first had to um, uh, swear uh, like an oath and fealty uh, to share power with Parliament uh, and pass laws and taxation by their consent and abide by the rule of English common law. So that's the beginning of really kind of uh, defanging uh, the monarch in England. So at any rate, that's the main data I use uh, on this one. And it contends, right, that they have a special history of loving liberty and um, having no tolerance for tyranny, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And it kind of transitions to this one. OK, so now you have um, you see the New England colonies here, right? New Hampshire, Massachusetts Bay, uh, Plymouth, uh, Rhode Island and Connecticut, New Haven, et cetera. All right. Uh, so with number one, what we try to do is we're trying to claim just like the Whigs contend, they believe they believed in uh, English exceptionalism, right, that they were they were uh, special. Uh, this is American exceptionalism right here. Uh, tied to uh, the Puritans and the Pilgrims, all right? So first of all, right, you, uh, I would imagine you guys might know the uh, the basics of the Protestant Reformation um, with Martin Luther. Uh, 
So the narrative goes, right, that Martin Luther um, kind of got the ball rolling. Uh, but there there were some issues that the Catholic Church admitted to uh, by that time. They were uh, they were getting a little out of hand with the, um, the selling of indulgences uh, to um, have people... Uh, the equivalent of going to uh, can uh, to penance to to go into confession and um, in getting absolved uh, by a priest, and with indulgences, it was mainly for people who had died and they believed were in purgatory, right? People who did not have a mortal sin on their soul, but had not gone through penance and properly been absolved of all of their uh, venial or smaller sins. So, at any rate, um, you had people like uh, Johann von Tetzel. In Germany, who were uh, taking advantage of people's uh, fear of their loved ones in purgatory and just kind of fleecing everybody of their money. Um, you had, um, you know, Pope Alexander VI uh, had all kinds of illegitimate children and he was supposed to, you know, um, uh, refrain from sexual activity um, in, as, as his vows. Uh, you had um, the church was highly involved in, um, in lending and uh, was a very rich institution. It was becoming a little bit corrupt and decadent. And so then uh, it was tipped off by Martin Luther, who supposedly mainly had ideological problems uh, with Catholic Church. So he contends, right, that when he had when he was um, trying to uh, do enough to feel forgiven by God, he kind of was OCD and, and excessive, and it didn't help. And then he was uh, to teach a, a college class as a friar in Germany, and um, he came across Romans and came across some verses that suggested that salvation is a gift that can't be earned. And so at any rate, um, he, uh, he nails his 95 theses to the Wittenberg Church, and he challenges a particular cardinal uh, to a debate. And um, they, uh, they would not, the cardinal would not debate with him. Uh, he uh, was told to recant, and that's the equivalent of repenting of your false beliefs, and he would not do so, and he was excommunicated, and he really uh, did his best to pull other people in with a printing press and everything uh, to side with him, and so uh, you had not only, uh, ba basically, right, uh, he said only scripture. Uh, that's the only authority he was willing to um, abide by. And as you guys may know, uh, like in the Gospel of Mark, uh, Jesus uh, uh, renamed Simon Peter. And like the Spanish piedra, it, it means rock or stone. And he said, on this rock, I'll build my church. And so um, as years went by, they started having um, synods, S-Y-N-O-D. And that is uh, the leaders who would be called bishops uh, from the main cities, Antioch, uh, Jerusalem, Rome, uh, et cetera, uh, began meeting and having synods. And then by 313, they'll put the Bible together uh, at a place called Nicaea in Turkey. But at any rate, uh, the Catholic Church contends to this day that Peter uh, wrote a letter to Clement and telling him that the keys of the church have been given to me, and I want you to have that power after me because he was martyred. And uh, he supposedly gave that power to Clement as the next bishop of Rome to be the leader of all the bishops and all the churches. And of course, that's the idea of the apostolic succession of the Pope. Um, uh, the Protestants fought against that and said that they did not recognize that, uh, that supremacy. Uh, they fought against, like I said, a soteriology, uh, their belief in how you're saved, how your soul is saved. And then... Um, they said that if if there was a uh, a part of liturgy, right, of the the carrying out of church services that could not be found in the Bible, uh, then they said that it, it shouldn't be done. Um, because remember, with the Catholic Church believing in the um, in the apostolic succession, uh, Jesus told Peter, "What you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and what you loose on earth will be loosened in heaven." And so the Catholic Church to this day believes that because of that, it has the right uh, to, to change and evolve and to make uh, declaratory decisions on behalf of everyone uh, on uh, church liturgy, on beliefs, etc., that along with scripture, uh, that um, church tradition 
also is a form of God's revelation uh, to be uh, obeyed. And the Protestants didn't go for that. And so they they um, they said just the Bible. And um, I'm trying to think anything else, like the major stuff. And then, of course, they, they threw out the Apocrypha. Uh, at Nicaea, they agreed uh, almost unanimously on 66 books. And they threw out several. Uh, I remember going to a Catholic college and we had to read the Gospel of Thomas. And to be honest, I found it to be bizarre. And they threw it out. Um, but at any rate, um, with the apocryphal books, these seven other books, they did not throw them out. Uh, but they didn't bind them together with the rest of the canon, with the rest of the books either. They set them apart uh, as to be handled by the, the church hierarchy. Well, you have the first and second book of Maccabees, like the Maccabean revolt uh, against, I think it was Rome. Uh, they um, In the second book of Maccabees, you have an illusion of people um, praying for the souls of people that have died. And so that's kind of the uh, the basis, the, the scriptural basis that the Catholic Church uses uh, for, um, for the idea of purgatory and the idea of penance or reconciliation, as they call it now. And so at any rate, uh, Martin Luther, he threw those seven apocryphal books out. And then, um, you know, you have transubstantiation, right, where the, the, the priest says, hocus corpus meum, this is my body. And they believe that something mystical happens where it turns into the blood and body of Christ uh, in the Eucharist. And um, the Protestants didn't, didn't agree with that. They said that, no, it just should be done in memory of what Jesus did in shedding his blood and, and sacrificing his body. So there are quite a few doctrinal things, uh, power things involved. And then, of course, you had the issue, right, of um, Spain was not the only country uh, to be granted the right by the Pope uh, to, um, to appoint their own clergymen, uh, their own bishops, their own priests, uh, their own friars, etc. And so sometimes, right, those decisions were political. Uh, someone owed, a king owed a family something or whatever, right? And so that was a basis for corruption, uh, but, but, but the Catholic Church definitely was enmeshed with much political power. And so some of the Protestants, they just turned Protestant because of power. Uh, they resented the bishops that had been chosen, or some of the priests, etc. And they knew that if they could break free from the Roman Catholic hierarchy— they would no longer be beholden to these uh, these clergymen. So uh, there are all kinds of uh, factors and motives involved. But supposedly, uh, with the Puritans and the Pilgrims, uh, they were they were pretty hardcore. Uh, they were pretty hardcore and genuinely having you know ideological issues with the Catholic Church uh, rather than anything to do with power. And so um, when the Anglican Church broke free from the Catholic Church, you know, uh, they didn't, it wasn't, it wasn't very genuine, right? Because uh, Henry VIII couldn't get his uh, marriage annulled from Catherine of Aragon, and the Pope refused to do so. If my memory serves me correctly, he was like by marriage related to Catherine of Aragon. But at any rate, he wouldn't annul it. And King Henry VIII, when the Protestant Reformation had begun, he wrote a treatise defending the Catholic Church. And he was even known by some as the defender of the faith of the Catholic uh, Church. But when he had this political issue over divorce, and I think there were other things involved that I don't recall, um, he made a very personal and political decision to break free from the Catholic Church and form his own English or Anglican Church. And in many ways, it was still Catholic. Uh, they, they kept the Apocrypha and the, uh, and the Sacrament of Penance. Uh, they, uh, they did their liturgy. liturgy uh, much like a Catholic mass. Uh, they had priests and they had the, the Episcopal form of church organization, the archbishops and bishops and priests, et cetera, right down the hierarchical chain. And so um, if you're a hardcore English Protestant, right, you're, you're, you're disappointed. You're greatly disappointed because you felt like you've been teased uh, that you broke free from Rome, but in many ways you're practically still Roman. And so uh, you're still, you're practically still Catholic. So um, they uh, they used the printing press. Uh, they had their own um, uh, uh, church uh, church uh, services, and they had to hide uh, because there was a guy that played the villain. Uh, his name was Archbishop William Loud L A U D, 
And Loud made the, the Anglican church look terrible in the sense that he made it, he made no bones about it in his honesty, that he was not much of a religious person. And he was not really, you know, uh, adamantly for these very Catholic-like institutions and practices, etc. For him, it was about power and unity. Uh, he wanted everyone loyal to the Anglican church um, because they were they were better ruled that way. And there'd be more uh, just safety and unity uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the monarchy. So at any rate, um, he began having people arrested. Uh, in some extreme cases, he even had them uh, killed. And of course, to the Protestants, that was equivalent to martyrdom. And so uh, there was a guy named John Fox, F-O-X-E, and Fox wrote a book uh, called um, uh, The Book of Martyrs. And what he does, is he points to different people that that stood up to the Catholic Church, and he makes the Catholic and the Anglican Church look awful. And um, you know, you had a, I I used to know the names. You had a guy that 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 first fought for the right of the lay peasant people to engage in the Eucharist and to be able to drink the wine and eat the wafer. Uh, they they had to fight for that. Uh, you had someone who fought for the right uh, for the uh, Bible to be. Um, printed by the Gutenberg press so that the peasants could read it for themselves. Uh, and so uh, he put them in his book of martyrdom and acted like it was this long tradition of this tyrannical Catholic and now Anglican church uh, taking away people's freedom of religion. And so at any rate, um, they went to Holland first, uh, these two groups, especially the pilgrims. And um, supposedly they did not like uh, the immorality that they experienced and observed in uh, Holland. Uh, they went to a college town called Leiden. Sometimes it's spelled L-E-Y, sometimes L-E-I-D-E-N. Uh, but what they don't kind of mention also is that they didn't like their lack of uh, complete uh, same rights as everybody else. They were called burger rights, right? Because remember Berg, uh, the, the suffix Berg means city. Uh, they didn't have all the same rights that those who uh, were Dutchmen and connected to the Dutch Reformed Church had. So they left there, and they didn't have enough money to do it on their own. And so uh, they they uh, they teamed up with about, it, it supposedly was about half and half, they teamed up with uh, non-believers who were in it for the money. And they called them, of course, strangers, and they called themselves and one another the saints. So the saints went with the strangers alike uh, across the Atlantic, and um, they were somehow uh, uh, begrudgingly allowed a charter. And uh, with the charter, it was it was it was supposed to be uh, above uh, Dutch. Um, well, no, not Dutch New York. The Dutch were five years behind them. It was just to be above uh, Maryland. So at any rate, um, uh, Catholic Maryland. So at any rate, um, they landed at, at um, uh, Cape Cod, right? Uh, they stayed on the ship for a day because it was Sabbath, and they uh, just prayed and sang psalms and so forth. And so, like I said, they, they did show a lot of evidence of being genuinely religious. Um, and also what they brag about is that uh, they, they were for everyone reading the Bible. Um, they, they, it was called the priesthood of all believers, uh, the expression by Martin Luther uh, that uh, why should the clergy alone uh, be given the power uh, to read and interpret scripture for everybody else? So under the idea of the priesthood of all believers, they had the first public school law uh, in North America, and it was called the Old Deluder Act. And of course, deluder means deceiver. So it's kind of ironic, right? The first public school system was established with the name of the devil uh, with it. So it was the Old Deluder Act, and any village of 50 people or more had to have, had to construct a school and had to pay for uh, a teacher uh, to come and teach the kids. And of course, the, the teaching was just absolutely revolved around religion, uh, around Christianity, um, but, but the literacy rates were the highest by far uh, in the Americas, period, of all the colonies. So um, they were proud of that. They properly elected uh, the church members. Uh, their own pastors, and they could properly unelect them and get them out. Um, some of them uh, formed a Presbyterian organization, 
and that they were the presbyters or the elders, uh, they were to be, um, again, uh, elected uh, by the people. And so they're either congregational or Presbyterian. And so that, that was kind of democratic, uh, their church organization. Uh, each church, uh, at least on paper, was completely autonomous. It had no bishop uh, that, that overran several churches. They wanted no outside interference. So each church was kind of autonomous. And so uh, they're, they're proud of all that. And then, of course, uh, it didn't take them long. And by 1636, they established um, Harvard. Uh, the Ivy League school, and um, they were they were into education and not just theology, the study of God. Uh, they they had like the the kind of the Greco Roman uh, liberal arts uh, involved at the at the college as well. So at any rate, they're proud of all that stuff, right? They had a regulated form of somewhat capitalism. Uh, if you wanted to join a guild, a G U I L D. Uh, depending on what you wanted to do for a living, like a labor union, they would usually allow you to do so. And so there was kind of a relative uh, uh, economic opportunity uh, there. They were not into, the, you know, the the, the mercantilist and, and monopoly-based uh, economic system. And they were proud of that. Um, I don't think anything else. And then with the pilgrims, uh, the pilgrims kept peace for 54 years uh, with the Wampanoag, uh, powerful Native American Confederacy. And of course, Massasoit, uh, Massasoit they have his um, statue there at Cape Cod. Uh, the, the one day I was able to spend over there, it was gorgeous. The sun off the water, even though it was freezing cold. And it was just, it's a beautiful, tranquil looking place where they landed. And um Things were tense at first. Uh, they they stole corn. Uh, they found a cache of corn underground and uh, dug it up. Uh, they had um, Squanto come and then another man named uh, Samoset. And Squanto came of his own uh, volition uh, because his Patuxet people had been wiped out by uh, European fishermen and their diseases. And um, Massasoit did not trust Squanto and did not like that he was trying to interact as a middleman. Uh, so he sent Samoset. And Samoset was very intimidating. And uh, it was a little bit tense at first. And then, of course, the English, right? They were not above, the pilgrims were not above having someone else kind of possibly do the dirty work that might need to be done. And so they had a guy named Miles Standish. And Miles Standish was the head of their militia. And... Um, yeah, he was not afraid to draw uh, to draw blood. Uh, matter of fact, uh, what they don't tell us as kids for the first Thanksgiving is um, things were a bit tense until uh, two things happened almost simultaneously. Uh, Massasui uh, was got very sick, and his favorite was uh, William Carver. He really liked William Carver. Thought he was a good natured man. And so he asked for Carver to come see him. And Carver brought an elixir, some type of like homemade medicine. And somehow Massasui got much better. And it developed his trust, uh, a, a deeper trust in the, uh, the pilgrim people. And then in return, he told them, oh, by the way, uh, the Massachusetts um, are planning to attack you guys. And so they sent Miles Standish uh, to um, to deal with them, and he feigns um, having a, um, a a meal of like you know um, uh, camaraderie. And it's supposed to be just a, a nice meeting together to get to know one another and so forth. And um, I don't recall how they. It might have been someone like Squanto, but they they already somehow early were uh, fortunate enough to have a translator. And um, he devises, he divines from what the the leader says that that it is true, that he's being deceitful and they're planning to attack the pilgrims. So literally while they're eating, uh, Miles Standish attacks them. Um, and uh, and he, he kills the leader with his own hand uh, in a knife. And so at any rate, they come back and say that they were triumphant, that they got their pre preemptive attack on the Massachusetts and all is well. 
And that's when they celebrated the Thanksgiving. And um, of course, the uh, uh, the leader of the Wampanoag, Massasui, uh, he was very much interested in the Englishman's uh, cannon and guns. And because he was concerned about the Naragan set, uh, the Naragan set tribe was equally powerful and could be warlike. And so uh, he wanted to make a military alliance and a diplomatic alliance with the pilgrims uh, on account of their weapons. And um, what was interesting about it also is that they had, um, it was one of equality. Uh, there was a, a, a term used in the uh, Algonquian language and it was Agua. It was, uh, they, they, they spelled it as uh, A-G-W-A and it means subordinate to, right? And it was very common that whoever you were superior to militarily, you would have a treaty with them where they were Agua, you, and then you were usually Agua, someone else. And there's this like, you know, this, this overarching hierarchy of power. But with the pilgrims in the, in the Wampanoag, uh, it was one of equality. And so hence, if a pilgrim went into Native American territory and committed one of their crimes, they would have to extradite that pilgrim and send him to the natives to carry out justice on him. And the same thing, if a native came into Plymouth and committed a crime, they would have to extradite him for the pilgrims to deal with him. So, you know, for that time period to have a, a treaty of equality, that was pretty impressive. And like I said, their, their, um, their uh, peace lasted from 1620 to 1674. And then in 1674, it was the son, one of the sons of Massasui, and his name was um, uh, Medicom. And uh, as soon as he got in charge, he came to Plymouth uh, with a list of demands. And it was mainly over land uh, where he felt the English had encroached upon their hunting grounds in, in uh, present day Connecticut and um, had not paid for it and had not received permission for it. And he made all these uh, kind of ultimatums. And one of the pilgrims kind of, um, well, this is the next generation to, you know, at least two generations. Uh, they said, uh, who does this man think he is? King Philip of Spain? And the name stuck. So it was known as King Philip's War. Um, but um, yeah, so for 54 years, they had peace. Then number two, right, is what I do is I, this is mainly conflict history. And this is mainly revisionist history. This is uh, critical. And especially of the Puritans. The Puritans were 10 years later. The Puritans started off with 3,000 right away. The Pilgrims started with 120. And so the, the Puritans were always much more numerous, more powerful, and they knew it. And they threw their weight around. And so they, uh, they made the tribes as well as their fellow English Christian pilgrims uh, be, quote, agua them and pay tribute to them. And so on more than one occasion, the pilgrims sent somebody back to England to complain of the Puritans uh, throwing their weight around. So uh, the Puritans, it only took them six years, from 1630 to 1636, and they got in a war with the Pequot. Um, and the Pequot... Uh, there were lots of factors, I believe, but the main, um, you know, the last straw that broke the camel's back was their arrogance about uh, against political equality. Uh, there was a guy, an Englishman, who was uh, uh, kidnapping Native American kids and demanding ransom for them. And um, he was finally caught and uh, killed uh, by the members of the Pequot tribe, they think. And so the Puritans uh, demanded that the Pequot, uh, it was like two to three gentlemen, uh, be handed over for justice. And the Pequot refused. And so at any rate, um, and like I said, there was drama over tribute and the unfairness of their relationship, etc. So that's all it took. And the, the Puritans were already at war. And then when you fast forward to King Philip's War in 1674, uh, the Puritans were not even asked by the pilgrims that I know of. Uh, to fight with them, and they took advantage of it, of this war, and they jumped in, and of course, they started taking Native American lands as they defeated them, and there was a telling uh, battle uh, whereby they, it was like the, the battle of the wilderness. They um, they came into a uh, Naragansett territory, uh, killed a lot of them, burned it to the ground, 
And then one of the Naragatset leaders left a piece of paper uh, on a tree. And the paper was their uh, treaty of alliance and peace between the Puritans and the Naragansett to try to shame them. Like, we're not even supposed to be fighting you. We're enemies of the guys you're fighting, the Wampanoags, right? And so they just went after the Naragansett as well. And they just kind of almost indiscriminately said, you know, kill the savages and so forth. And you don't have that same, you know, with the pilgrims, they at least sent out uh, um, John Elliott and a couple other people to try to uh, convert the natives. With the Puritans, they didn't show much of a desire uh, to do that. Um, to, uh, of course, um, Roger Williams uh, does a great job, but Roger Williams is going to end up being excommunicated by the Puritans, and he goes and founds Rhode Island. And the first thing he does is declare religious liberty in Rhode Island, because to him, the Puritans were the anti-model. So at any rate, uh, the Puritans, they, it's easy to find the dirt on them. Uh, they were vicious against Native Americans, uh, very much just kind of simplistically labeled them as savages to be killed. Um, they also were very, very um, exclusivist and undemocratic in many ways. Um, so for instance, right, with the Puritans, with church membership, uh, you had to uh, agree uh, precisely on your theology with their leaders, then you had to prove to them and convince them that you had had, had a born again experience. As Jesus said, you must be born again. Uh, they had to buy your story uh, that you'd been born again. Then you also had to prove to them uh, that you were becoming more like Christ since you've become born again. Uh, the fancy words, right, with the Protestants, because they believe it's all just kind of a free gift, they, they believe that justification happens that easily, uh, that you accept Christ and his, his atonement on the cross, and you're forgiven, and you're justified in God's eyes. But then, right, then you become sanctified, you become holier uh, once you've been uh, born again. And so they'd have to have letters of rec, uh, witnesses come and say how they'd become a holier and better person since their born again experience. And again, the Puritan leaders had to buy it. If they didn't, they did not accept you as a member. Uh, you could not partake in communion or the Eucharist. Uh, you had to, um, but yet if you did not come to church, they fined you uh, and you had to pay. Uh, they mandated that everyone tithe, even non-church uh, members, had to pay one-tenth of, of, of their, their income and their assets uh, to, the, to the church leaders. And so they, they were hardcore. They, were, uh, they could be very, very um, uh, elitist. And so, um, yeah, you had that side of the Puritans. And then, of course, you also have with the Puritans, you have the um, the um, the covenant. OK, with the covenant, right, they get this from the Old Testament of the Bible uh, with the Hebrew people. Right. Where God tells them, all right, here's Moses's Ten Commandments. Right. Or my Ten Commandments through Moses. And um I'm gonna watch. I'm gonna. I'm gonna watch you. And if the if you, as my people that I've made a covenant with, uh, if you begin to sin and live in sin, uh, then I'm gonna turn my blessings away, and I'm gonna turn my protection away uh, from your entire community, and I'm gonna let you fall prey to droughts and famines and war, uh, and all the things you fear. But if you, as a people, uh, by and large. Uh, obey my commandments, then I'll bless you, and I'll bless your economy, I'll bless your food, I'll bless your military, etc. So now, right, what that opens up to is 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 kind of a, a form of tyranny. Is uh, the the Puritans elected select men, and these select men would come and spy on people in their homes to see if they were up to any kind of hidden sin. Because uh, they didn't want God to turn his back on the entire community. So it very much was not amenable to liberty. Uh, this idea of the covenant from the Old Testament that they took very seriously uh, in, um, in Boston. And so, like I said, uh, if they even uh, surmised that maybe God was unhappy with them, like if they had like an epidemic hit the people, uh, if they started getting attacked uh, by natives, et cetera, right? Um, they would declare everybody have to fast and pray and come to church. 
and uh, make sure that they get right with God um, so that God will be kind to the whole community. And then lastly, of course, the Puritans are the ones that had the Salem witch trials. And I'll let you read the basics of that on your own. And then just as two people I reckon I, I, I put in here, uh, Anne Hutchinson was a woman who had the audacity to have her own Bible study. And she said, right, how uh, uh, Jesus says somewhere in the New Testament that people are going to be surprised uh, by who is uh, who is a, um, a lamb and who is a goat. And of course, the goats go to hell and the, and the sheep go to heaven. And he said, you're going to have some religious leaders, basically, that you think are holy, and they're going to end up being goats. And you're going to have people that you think are sinners, and they're going to end up being sheep. And so she's she's teaching this in her home, and she said, it would be just like Satan to put goats as our leaders. And so she suggested that some of the Puritan leaders were really secretly agents of the devil that were heading for hell. And so they told her to recant. She refused, and they banished her from uh, from Puritan Boston. And then Roger Williams, he also made them look bad. He uh, he was all for uh, freedom of conscience. He said people should not have to go to church if they don't want to. They should not have to accept Christ if they don't want to. Uh, that it it has to be from the heart. It has to be volitional by choice, and there should be a separation of church and state. And so they told him to recant, he refused, and they banished him as well. All right. So anyway, uh, then in Pennsylvania, what I do here is I do good old court history of William Penn. Um, this guy, right, I contend that he used his religious conversion to be a huge blessing to the political and economic legacy of this country, but in particular of Pennsylvania. Okay, um, he was known before becoming a Christian as being quite vain. Uh, he chased the ladies. He was kind of like a pretty boy. He uh, was born into his dad's wealth, and so he was very privileged, and he kind of lived a, a, a superficial lifestyle. Uh, but then um, he goes to a couple meetings of the Quakers, and you know the Quakers in many ways were hardcore. And uh, he becomes a Quaker. And one of the biggest things with the Quakers, right, was the Christian um, the Christian virtue of meekness, right? I've heard a, a priest liken meekness to um, a big, powerful horse uh, that allows uh, a man or woman to lead it. Uh, meekness is, is being very gentle and obedient and humble uh, with the strength that you have. So at any rate, um, what does he do is he is given like almost despotic power over Pennsylvania uh, by the king, by King James. Um, he is given uh, it, it supposedly was a barony, like a like like old school, like in the medieval time periods when a baron uh, rules over uh, land. Remember, the baron holds the land in the name of the king and everyone who holds land beneath him holds the land under him, right? So there's really not much of a modern concept of, of ownership of property. Uh, you're basically a tenant on the governor's land. You're basically a renter. Uh, he changed that. Uh, he decided instead, and by the way, you were supposed to pay quitrants, and quitrants were medieval tribute taxes to the real landowner. And he never, he never accepted a single quitrant payment. He sold the land, and to the first... I can't remember how many settlers he gave it for free. Um, so he was super generous with land ownership. Um, also, he went out of his way uh, to bring um, uh, lenders, uh, bankers uh, to Pennsylvania to allow people to uh, get credit and uh, have capital to start a business. And usually that business was either a cash crop farmer um, or an artisan, a skilled worker. Uh, speaking of artisan, uh, he started uh, the um, the legacy of almshouses uh, that existed back in England and in um, some places of Europe, but had not existed here yet. Um, an almshouse, right? If you're homeless 
Uh, you come to it, you get free quarter, you get free food and drink, and they teach you a trade uh, to get you on your feet and uh, to to help you to be able to uh, get back on your feet. So these almhouses were kind of like, you know, some of these like um, uh, these homeless shelters that that provide education and job training and so forth today. So we had that. Then politically, right, he decided to share power uh, with a poverty elected two branch uh, legislator. And he didn't have to. According to his treaty, he did not have to. But he said he said that he doesn't want the power to do any mischief over his people. And that he said, you could now have power or have a laws of your own making, he said. All right. So also, it just so happened uh, that Pennsylvania is very, well, had very, very fertile soil. So Pennsylvania is in some ways, along with New York, uh, is tied to the notion of America being a land of economic opportunity. The American dream. People, a lot of people uh, did well economically in Pennsylvania. So I brag on him here. And then notice this. He also sent out his brochures uh, for cheap land and available credit uh, to all kinds of different countries in Europe. Uh, uh, Flanders or Flemish, uh, Flanders is Belgium, uh, Germany, uh, Switzerland, Sweden, uh, Portugal, like all kinds of different European countries. And uh, not only that, according to Alan Brinkley's textbook, he deliberately had them go to the marginalized, to the to the areas of the poor in Europe, and tell them that there was a, a there was a, the perfect place for them to have a chance. Was it was in his colony, right? Then this is revisionist. I do a one eighty. And this is kind of all the dirt I could find on this guy uh, from the biographies I've gotten my hands on is um, he was constantly trying to buy more and more land from the Native Americans. And I forgot to tell you that part. Um, he showed them great respect uh, as far as symbolism. Uh, he learned their dialects. He learned like at least eight dialects, uh, Native American ones. Um, he spoke to them in their language. He had annual meetings. One year would be in Philadelphia, and the next year it would be at Susquehannock, uh, where the natives were. And um, they followed Native American protocol uh, at the meetings. Uh, they wanted a chance for the Native American leaders to, to list or air any grievances that they had, and usually it was over land. And he would try to make good on those grievances and give them justice. So much so that he developed a reputation for being too soft on the Native Americans. However, on this one, I say he's he was constantly pressuring them to sell more and more lands. And he had to have known that in the long run, that was going to direly hurt them. And there's no evidence of him losing any sleep over that. See, they called him uh, Onas or Mikon, and it meant the feather or quill pen. I said, every time we see this guy, he's got pen and parchment and wanting us to sell more land to him. And some of these cases, right, he was the middleman. Uh, so, for instance, he was real big on wanting to get people to bring credit, right, uh, to Pennsylvania. But some of these bankers, they gave ultimatums. They said, I will not be near a savage. They frighten me. I don't want to be anywhere near them. So before I'm willing to come over and offer uh, credit, you have to make that land completely devoid of natives. You got to purchase all their land, and I want to be surrounded by nothing by nothing but Euro Americans. So at any rate, that's what he does, and he just buys more and more land, and he's got to know uh, in the long run that that's going to hurt the natives. And then lastly, this is a pretty simple thesis is, you know, you have people on both ends of this, and I chose to be more cynical on this one, and, and maybe I'm being too harsh on the Dutch. 
when you look at the Netherlands, right, they had experienced colonization by Spain. Uh, what happened was that it was the Holy Roman Emperor, right? They joked that he was not holy, it was not Roman, and it wasn't much of an empire. But the Holy Roman Emperor was Charles V, and he was granted uh, uh, the Netherlands. And um, he fought for him, and he kind of just um, uh, was very insistent. And then his, uh, his one of his sons, uh, Philip II, is going to really uh, adamantly try to um, assimilate the, the Dutch. With Charles V, it was good enough just to have law and order there. But with Philip II, he was a hardcore Catholic, and he wanted them to come back to the Catholic fold. Uh, because they joined the Reformation and were Protestant. It was called the, the Dutch Reformed Church. So at any rate, when he couldn't get his way, he established the Spanish Inquisition. And they actually like burnt people at the stake and all of that. So the idea is, right, is the Dutch saw the Spanish as an anti-model that they did not want to be like and live under. And so when they, as they were fighting uh, this fight, uh, they try to be as tolerant themselves as possible. So like I mentioned, the town of Leiden, um, Amsterdam, uh, some of these cities, right? They had uh, um, Muslim mosques. They had Jewish synagogues. They had Protestant churches and they had Catholic cathedrals. So at any rate, um, you definitely did did have some, um, some tolerance back in, in the Netherlands. However, right, you know, you have all these policies that are that are on paper, very tolerant. And I will never forget, um, I have a nephew who plays soccer, and um, there was uh, Josie Altidore, and maybe I shouldn't have named him, but he's an African-American, and uh, he was on the U.S. team for a while. Uh, they call it, I think, the number nine, the guy in the middle in the front, a striker. And he went to the Netherlands to play, and I won't even tell you what they did, but it was horrible. It was so racist. They were terrible to him in the Netherlands. And we're talking just 10 years ago. So at any rate, the Dutch established New York, okay? Um, in 1625, they claim it. Uh, they bought, yes, it is true that they bought the island of Manhattan, from the Canarsie natives, who were not even the rightful owners of the Manhattan Island. And yes, it is true that they bought it with the equivalent, uh, who a famous guy wrote it in the early 1900s, said was the equivalent of $24, uh, and totally fleeced the natives. Um, but when they came in, right, uh, they very early, uh, at two places in particular, right, um, New Amsterdam, which was New York City, and at Albany, uh, they called it Beavervik. Uh, at those two money-making places, you did have Jewish synagogues, Muslim mosques, uh, the first here in the U.S., um, all kinds of denominations of Christianity, right? So they did absolutely um, allow, uh, you know, on paper, uh, there was quite tolerance, Okay. But it, to me, it was very simple from the book that I read, the, the Island at the Center of the World or something like that. Um, it was like a bestseller. But in it, right, the governor, uh, Stuyvesant, as well as other leaders uh, there in New York, in New Amsterdam, uh, were quite intolerant of the Quakers, of the Jews. Um, there was another, there was a, a North African Muslim guy, a Tunisian, I think. And, um, oh gosh, what did they call him? Uh, they literally called him Black something. Oh, darn it. I'm sorry. It's not coming to me right now. But at any rate, he was at uh, Albany. And with these cases, right, they just were just ugly toward them. And they write these letters whereby they want to kick him out. Or they want to discriminate against him in some way or another. And they write to the Hague. Right, the like the the Parliament of the Netherlands, and that the Hague says that you must um, you must tolerate them, and they ordered that the Dutch West India Company, uh, you know, give the rationale for it, and the Dutch West India Company said 
We know that the Jews are a deceitful race of people who love mammon or money more than they love their God. Like all the old medieval stereotypes, right? But they said, because they are contributing to the Dutch West India Company, you must leave them alone. So what I'm saying, right, is that the Dutch were tolerant, but for all the wrong reasons. Yes, they were tolerant because they didn't like the intolerance of Spain. And yes, they were they they were tolerant because they wanted to make money. They wanted the the the, the island nation. Uh, they wanted new New Amsterdam, New Netherlands uh, to prosper. So they put up with these people. Pure and simple. But in the modern sense of toleration, like uh, egalitarianism, everyone is equal and on equal footing. No way. No way. They're, 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 I'm making the argument that their system of toleration did not come from the right motives. Okay. Got to get another name down. All right, so does anybody have any questions? All right, so are you guys doing okay? Yeah, thank you. Anytime. Thank you, Lincoln. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you, Alexis. All right. Well, I wish you guys well, okay? And, um... Uh, pretty soon, next time, we'll be doing the test. And at least on the first one, I'm going to go through all of it. So try right. to be here next uh, week, okay? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, guys. You guys have a good week, okay? Hang in there. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye-bye. See too. you next week. Sounds good. Sorry, my computer not computing. <laughs>